Yes, I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that lovely introduction. I assume everyone can hear me, can see my screen. Yeah, yes, perfect. Yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Um, so good evening from Istanbul and good afternoon or morning to those of you in different time zones. <laughs> uh, first, I wanna thank the organizers, of course, for inviting me to speak here with you today. Uh, I'll be talking today, as Rana said, about burial practices at Telechana Alalak, and how the intersection between a study of those practices and bioarchaeology, specifically stable isotope and ancient DNA analyses, can reveal aspects of social and cultural identities in the lives and deaths of the inhabitants of the site, and also about some of the limits of these methods. Before I begin, I'd also like to say that the DNA and Isotope Project was part of a collaboration with the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History under the umbrellas of both the Max Planck Harvard Research Center for the Archaeoscience of the Ancient Mediterranean and the European Research Council Food Project, Project Food Transforms. And I thank all of our collaborators on both of those projects, as well as Rula Shafiq, our bioarchaeologist and human remains specialist, who has generously shared her preliminary assessments of the ages and sexes of the skeletons with me. And of course, the Telechana directors, Aslihan Yener and Murat Akar, for the permission and ability to work on this fascinating material. So, identity in archeology. span There's always been a sense in our discipline that we want to access not just what people did, the tools they used, the buildings they lived in, the things they made and wore, et cetera, but who they were in a more fundamental sense, both as social groups and as individuals. Throughout its history, archeology span has taken inspiration from many other disciplines in an effort to get at the identities of ancient people, from history to sociology, from anthropology to linguistics to psychology and so on and so forth. But identity is a tricky thing to pin down as I think is clear from even the briefest survey of the many discussions taking place today about the topic, both in and outside of academic circles. Part of the issue in understanding identity is that it is multifaceted and each person's identity is made up of a constellation of multiple individual and group identities, gender, nationality, social, professional, et cetera. And people connect with and emphasize different aspects of their identity in different times and situations. Identity is also fluid. It can change and evolve over time with different aspects coming to the fore or receding and some identities replacing others as a person's life circumstances change and their experience accumulates. Without modern subjects to interview on the topic and to ask about their identities then, what other ways can we get at this kind of information? Since our studies are based on physical remains and material culture, Mental and emotional realities, such as identity, are naturally more difficult to get at. And archaeologists have come up with many different proposals throughout the years for ways that we can read the material record for hints to these questions. Burials, of course, have always been a key category of evidence in this search for material correlates of identity for a number of reasons, including their intentionality, their links to emotion and religion, and the fact that burial practices are often, if not culturally determined, then at least culturally influenced. In addition to the large body of theory surrounding the interpretation of burials, a growing constellation of bioarchaeological methods, including isotopes and ancient DNA analyses, alongside the identification of pathologies, biological sex, and other analyses of skeletal material, have opened up new perspectives and opportunities to reconstruct the lives of ancient individuals, sometimes in great detail. What then can these reconstructions tell us about identity? Today, I'll look at the diverse and well-studied burial record at Telechana and focus on examining questions of identity and how different aspects of it may have overlapped and interconnected with patterns revealed by isotopic and DNA studies looking at which facets of identity impacted on and were expressed in funerary practices at the site. In case you're not already familiar with the site of Telechana, I'll briefly give an overview. 
Located in the Amuk Valley in southeastern Anatolia, the city was a regional capital throughout the second millennium BC during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, with a limited Iron Age occupation centered around the city's main temple. The first excavations at the site were conducted by Sir Leonard Woolley in the 1930s and 40s, and Aspahan Yenner restarted excavations in 2003, which continue today under the direction of Muratakar. Politically, the site changed hands several times over its history. The Middle Bronze II is associated with the political and cultural dominance of the Amorite kingdoms in northern Syria. In Late Bronze I, the city became a vassal of Mitanni and part of the Hurrian sphere. And the Late Bronze II represents Hittite control of the site, after which it was mostly abandoned around 1300 BC. Throughout the sequence, there are high levels of internationalism evident at Achana, and both material and textual evidence suggests that there was a lot of movement, not just of goods like pottery and agricultural products, but also of the people who were moving these things around. Things don't often move on their own, after all. So what kinds of burial evidence do we have? <clears throat> In total, 345 burials have been documented from periods eight through one, covering the late Middle Bronze II through the Late Bronze II. And they've been found across all areas of the site. Just under half of them were published by Woolley and found in the so-called Royal Precinct and in what he termed Site H on the southern flank of the mound, where he uncovered defensive and domestic architecture associated with a city gate. Something that's important to keep in mind is that we're just simply missing a lot of information about the graves he excavated, as well as all of the skeletal material he found. Apparently, no one ever examined these skeletal remains, so we're missing even the most basic age and sex data for most of them. Although Willie does sometimes indicate age categories, presumably based on a kind of general eyeballing rather than on actual study. We don't know what exactly he did with the skeletons, as he doesn't specify in any of his publications. We assume they were reburied somewhere, but if so, we don't know where. So we have varying levels of information about this entire large chunk of our data set, and none of it is available for modern sampling or analysis. The 194 burials from the renewed excavations have been found all over the mound, with the yellow squares on the site map here indicating those where burials have been recovered. In area three on the northeastern slope of the mound, the city fortification wall has been documented, and a dense cemetery outside the city wall has been excavated, with a second cemetery area within the city walls found in area four in the south of the mound. The rest of the burials are scattered throughout the excavation squares, mostly as isolated examples in courtyards and other open spaces, under floors, and in abandoned buildings. In general terms, roughly two-thirds of the graves are single, simple pit burials, with individuals in both flexed and extended positions. However, looking at the corpus as a whole, there's a wide variety of grave types, including multiple burials and secondarily treated burials, along with other more minority types, such as cremations, pot burials, and several more elaborate tombs, such as cyst graves, the rich plastered tomb, and the so-called shaft grave, a chamber tomb discovered by Woolley in the Middle Bronze Palace. All ages are represented in the sample, with the unknown category here in the pie chart representing most of Woolley's graves, as well as highly disturbed burials in the Area 3 cemetery. Nevertheless, from the data available, we have roughly 50% adults, which is in line with estimates of what can be expected to constitute a representative archaeological sample. We also have a nearly 50-50 split between identified females and males, these generally representing adults, of course. So given that we seem to have a roughly more or less representative sample of the population of Alawak, what kinds of identity can we see? I want to look first at the isotopic and ADNA results specifically. These focus on information about diet, mobility, and ancestry, and have the potential to reveal differences between, for example, different social status groups, different ages or sexes, and culturally specific diets, such as food taboos, as well as patterns such as migration, transhumance, <clears throat> and exogamy practices, and potentially the ability to link specific burial practices or grave goods to particular cultures or regions of origin. 
In total, we have 77 samples for carbon and oxygen from teeth, 51 samples from carbon and nitrogen from bone, 53 samples for strontium, also from teeth, and 37 DNA samples taken from petrous bones, which is the, the bone that's inside your ear. So let's look at the DNA results first. We can see that all the individuals sampled from Achana, the green circles here on this PCA, are very homogeneous from a population genomics perspective, with only one exception. This one at the top here, off all by itself. This extreme outlier position is closest to sampled individuals from Bronze Age Iran and Central Asia. It seems, therefore, that either this individual or their recent ancestors migrated to the Alawak region. <clears throat> and we'll circle back to this person in a minute. The rest of the individuals cluster closely with those sampled from nearby Ebla from both third and second millennia in BC contexts. Those are the yellow circles on this image. Both of these groups, Achana and Abla, fall between contemporary Central Anatolian and Central and Southern Levantine individuals. And models of the Alawak individuals best describe their ancestry as a combination of Anatolian, Levantine, and Iranian and Caucasian origins. The genetic homogeneity of the Achana samples suggests that the recent ancestors of most people came from within the wider region around the Amuk Valley and Ebla. Moving on to layer in the isotopic analyses. For those of you who may not be familiar with strontium isotope studies, I'll just give a brief background on the method. Strontium isotopes are used in archeology, span of course, primarily for mobility studies. <laughs> And the method depends on determining a local isotopic signature and comparing the human results to this local range to determine whether individuals are local or non-local. As you can see illustrated here, strontium signatures in humans are derived from bedrock strontium values. Strontium originates in the bedrock and moves through the food chain, entering the human body via plants and animals and substituting for calcium during bone and tooth formation. So areas with different geologies result in different strontium signatures. For our study, we sampled tooth enamel, which forms in childhood and doesn't remodel, meaning that the results indicate where a person lived when the tooth sampled was formed. We sampled second molars, M2s, which form in childhood, roughly between the ages of two and eight. So the strontium isotope results here detect whether an individual grew up locally at Alawak and spent their childhood there, or whether they arrived later. For several individuals of particular interest, we sampled multiple molars to try to capture several different stages of life. In order to interpret the strontium results though, we need to understand what the local strontium values are, which means taking samples. Archeological strontium isotope studies use a variety of sample types for this, although animal bones and teeth are the most widely used, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. You can see from this geological map that there's a wide range of geological formations in and around the valley. And we wanted to get local baselines, both for the Amuk Valley as a whole and for Telachana specifically, so that we could get an idea of this variation. For Achana itself, we used 35 snail and faunal examples from excavated contexts, but for the valley, we didn't have archeological samples. And so we used modern snail shells, which are easy to find in many areas. Since snails aren't very mobile and don't travel very far throughout their lives, the results give a good idea of the strontium available in a very restricted area. We analyzed 14 shells from around the valley, and you can see the locations on the map. The results from those modern and ancient environmental samples are shown here in black and gray on the right side of the graph. In order to calculate a local range, Strontium studies typically take the mean of the environmental samples and then add and subtract to standard deviations. Because we have samples from both Achana specifically and from the valley generally, we were able to calculate two local ranges, one for Achana, which is calculated from the archeological samples and is shown here in blue, and one for the Amuk as a whole, which is calculated from the modern samples and shown here in orange. When we compare these ranges to the results from the humans, 
40 individuals plot inside the range of Alawak, meaning they likely both grew up and died in the city, and another eight plot within the range for the Amuk Valley, but outside of the Achana range, meaning they probably grew up outside of the city itself, but somewhere else within the valley. <laughs> Five individuals are identified as non-locals to both Alawak and the Amuk, plotting outside both local ranges. As I mentioned, for several individuals, we analyzed multiple teeth to try and get a better idea of where they lived at different times of their lives. And we see a few different patterns emerge from these results. One individual, sample number ALA 110, in the circle all the way to the left of the graph, has a second molar that yielded the lowest value among the whole group, but the third molar is near the mean for Alawak, which indicates that this person moved to the city in later childhood between the formation of the second and third molars, maybe around seven to 10 years old. Another individual, Alawak 98, the middle one circled here at the bottom, yielded very similar values for both teeth, both of them outside the range for the Amuk. It appears then that this individual spent their entire childhood and youth somewhere else entirely, moving to Alawak later as an adult. The rightmost circled individual, Ala 48, apparently came from the Amuk, though not Alawak, and seems to have moved during their adolescence <laughs> based on the separation in the values. This could have been to a different place in the valley, or it could have been Alawak if the move occurred while the third molar was forming since it falls just outside the range for Alawak. The other individual we analyzed multiple molars from was the genetic outlier that we saw in the previous slide. She's been dubbed the well lady because her remains were found at the bottom of a well, potentially a victim of murder. Working off the initial idea that she migrated to the region based on her DNA results, we sampled all three of her molars and the results of all three fall very close to the Achana mean and well within the local range for Alawak, as you can see here. It seems then <clears throat> that the well lady herself did not migrate, but rather that her ancestors did. The strontium evidence is consistent with her having spent her whole life at Achana, despite her very different DNA profile. Although we can't entirely rule out the possibility that she spent her childhood in a place with similar strontium signatures that was not Alawak. So looking at the other isotopic results may give us some more information, both on the population generally and on some of these interesting individuals in particular. The oxygen results don't tell us much, unfortunately. Oxygen primarily enters the human body through drinking water, and its isotopic value is mainly determined by the water cycle and the ways in which oxygen moves through it with the isotopic value changing according to variables such as elevation, temperature, and distance from the sea. The overall range of values for Achana is 4.1 per mil, which is fairly large, but despite two per mil being often still cited as the expected amount of intra-group variation, further more recent research is proving in-group statistics more reliable for identifying outliers since so many factors influence oxygen values including things like methods of food preparation and overall diet composition. When we look at the oxygen values of the population as a whole then, which you see on the bottom of the slide here in the graph, no outliers appear. Turning to the carbon and nitrogen results, these tell us about diet and what people were eating. Briefly, Carbon isotopes can identify the plant sources of diets, and nitrogen isotopes identify the trophic level on the food chain and the contribution of meat and other animal products to human diets. <clears throat> there are two main groups of plants identifiable through carbon isotopes, which are distinguished based on the pathways carbon takes during photosynthesis, which are called C3 and C4 plants. Most human food plants are C3, with the exception of a handful of C4 plants like maize, millet, and sorghum. But many grasses are also C4 and can influence human diets via animals who consume them. When we look at diet and the carbon isotope results then, they show mainly C3 food sources, which isn't surprising since all the recovered food plants at the site and the majority of the natural vegetation in the area are C3 plants. 
the small ranges of carbon values in both tooth appetite and bone collagen indicate that the majority of the population consumed isotopically similar carbon sources. And the results are in line with plants recovered archeologically that have been analyzed. The nitrogen results indicate that the population as a whole had regular access to sources of animal protein. The only statistically significant difference among the population in nitrogen results is between adult males and females, with males being higher than females, suggesting that adult males had greater access to animal protein in the form of animal products. So in the isotopic and genetic results, the only burial practice that can be associated with non-locals or any sort of individuals that stand out is secondary burial. Of the five secondary burials sampled, four of them were non-local to Alawak itself, coming from either the Amuk Valley or from other areas entirely. And two of the five non-locals identified were subject to secondary burial practices. A particularly interesting case is a single burial consisting of only three mandibles, one of which was a non-local and the other two of which came from the Amuk, but not Alawak specifically. And given the wide separation of their strontium values, it seems that they came from two different places. Unfortunately, we have no DNA results for either of these individuals since the DNA sampling targeted petrous bones, which aren't present in this mandible burial, of course. Despite their different origins though, they, or rather parts of them, ended up buried together at Alawak. How to explain this correlation of non-locals and secondary burials? These individuals may have been subject to secondary burial treatments because this was a stronger tradition in their homelands. And so their families buried them in this traditional way. Although secondary burial was a minority practice at Alawak itself. This explanation would indicate that secondary burial was, in some way at least, culturally linked and expressed a cultural identity, materializing ties with their home settlements. However, due to the nature of secondary burial, it's also possible that only parts of them were buried at Alawak, and the rest of their remains were transferred back to their homes for disposal, or, in the opposite scenario, that they didn't die at Alawak and that parts of them were brought there for burial after their deaths. Ala 98, one of the individuals in the mandible burial, may be an example of this. Based on the two molars sampled for this individual, they spent their entire childhood and youth outside of the Amuk, and therefore this part of them could have been transported to Alalak specifically for burial after their death. In other words, this person may never have set foot in Alalak and was only brought there after they had died. The reasons for this type of practice could have had to do with status, with perhaps political elites wanting to associate themselves with the regional power center, or it could also have had religious motivations, since Alalak was a major cult center, as two possible suggestions, both of which would also tie in with identities and their expression through burial practices. Another example that the ADNA and isotopic data helps us unravel is the plastered tomb. This constructed tomb is the most elaborate and richest grave found at the site to date, and it contains four individuals encased in plaster and arranged in two layers, one on top of the other. The tomb itself is located in the Area 3 Cemetery on the northern edge of the mound, and it was a particular target for sampling in this project. So we have isotopic data for all four of the individuals and ADNA data for three of them. The fourth individual was also sampled for DNA, but unfortunately the DNA was not well preserved enough to analyze. Before I talk about the results though, I wanna run through how the tomb was built to give a better idea of how unique this tomb is. So the first step was the preparation of a bed of cobblestones and pithos fragments that was then covered in white plaster and this served as the base of the structure. Onto this prepared floor was set the body of an adult male, Allah 001, 40 to 45 years old at his death, deposited on his back with his head propped up on a large jar and with his legs flexed to one side. He had a piece of thick plaster inserted into his mouth. 
With him were found the bones of an adult female, Ala 003, also 40 to 45 years old at her death. Her skeleton was disarticulated though. <clears throat> her skull was placed at his pelvis, as you can see in this photo. And many of the rest of her bones were stacked to the side of the man's body. It's possible that she was deposited first and that the grave was then reopened for the deposition of the man and that her at least partially skeletonized remains were reorganized at this time. Many grave goods were placed with these two individuals, although it's not possible in most cases to determine which one they should be associated with, if indeed such a separation was made by the people who built the tomb. A gold ring and pieces of gold foil that may have been hair rings, a handful of pins made of silver and copper alloy, beads of vitreous materials, carnelian, amber, and bone, and various ceramic vessels, including two Cypriot base ring jugs were found in this layer, as well as several gold foil appliques stamped with rosette designs arranged around the man's chest and pelvis that were presumably sewn onto some kind of cloth or clothing. These two individuals were then sealed with a thin layer of plaster shaped into a concave bed on its upper side. On top of this thin plaster layer, a young adult male, Ala 002, was laid, again, more or less placed on his back with his legs flexed to the side. A vertical bone was found in his mouth, as well as an in situ necklace of alternating gold, carnelian, and vitreous white beads. Copper alloy pins were found in the area of his chest, as well as more of the same type of stamped gold appliques. Another layer of plaster was applied over this young male, and then the final individual was deposited, another adult woman, Ala 38, who died at the age of 35 to 45. This woman was placed in the opposite direction to the other three. Unfortunately, her remains were poorly preserved due to the proximity to the surface. And there was some post-depositional disturbance to this topmost layer. She also had copper alloy pins in the area of her thorax as well as beads of amber, gold, and stone, in addition to a rare iron bead. Also found in this upper layer, although it's not necessarily clear which of the two individuals they should be associated with, were a bone pin, two clay pellets, and several more ceramic vessels. The entire tomb was then sealed by a final layer of plaster that apparently curved around a barrel vaulted coffin based on the wood grain impressions that were preserved on the inside of the plaster. A superstructure made of mud brick seems to have been constructed, but due to the post-depositional disturbance, was only preserved in the form of two columns of mud brick bolstering both ends of the tomb. It's not clear if the superstructure was designed to be visible or if it served as more of a practical measure to keep the tomb steady, to keep it from collapsing. If part or all of the tomb was above ground, its placement at the edge of the mound and the striking white color of the plaster that encased it would have ensured that it was visible from a distance when approaching the city from the north. This question of the superstructure and its ultimate visibility is just one of the lingering questions about this tomb. Although the general order of the interments is clear based on the archeological evidence, the number of separate interments and the time interval between them, if one existed, is not. So there could have been between one and up to four separate events. The disarticulated state of all of three suggests that either this woman was buried here and then the grave was reopened to include the older man, Ala one, or that Ala three was initially buried somewhere else and then her remains were collected and reburied together with Ala one. So looking at the DNA can give us some more information. Stratigraphically, the tomb belongs to period four at Alalak, which matches the grave goods, both placing it in and around the 15th century BC. Since it's routine practice to do radiocarbon dating when DNA analysis is successful, we have C14 dates from three of the individuals, Ala 1, 2, and 38. Ala 3, the woman who was found disarticulated in the bottom layer, is the one where the DNA analysis was unfortunately unsuccessful. The radiocarbon dates all confirm the archaeological dating sometime around the 15th century BC. We also know from the DNA analysis that both Ala 1 and 38 are first degree relatives, so parent child or siblings. And we know that both of these individuals, Ala 1 and 38, are second degree relatives of Ala 2. 
So this could be an aunt, uncle, and niece, nephew, grandparent, grandchild, or half siblings. When we combine all of this with the osteological data on age and with the order of interments in the tomb, we can propose this family tree. Allah I, who died in his 40s and was buried in the bottom layer, was the father of Allah 38, who died in her 30s or 40s and was buried in the top layer. They both seem to have died in the first half of the 15th century, based on the overlap in their C14 dates. Allah II, the young adult man buried in the top layer, a second degree relative to both of them, seems to have been the grandson of Allah I and the nephew of Allah 38. And he may have died either slightly later than the first two or around the same time as Allah 38, since remember he was deposited under her. Probably sometime during the first decades of the second half of the 15th century BC. <clears throat> This clearly then was a family tomb. And although we don't have DNA data for all of three, we can speculate that she was also a member of this family. Indeed, Rula Shafiq has identified non-metric skeletal traits for this individual that indicate she may be genetically related to the others. It's possible, given that she may have been the first of these individuals to die based on the disarticulated state of her remains and that she was in her forties when she died, that she belonged to a previous generation not shown here on the family tree. The mother of Allah I, maybe, perhaps his sister, his aunt. This is speculation for the moment, though, and there are other possibilities that we can't yet distinguish between. If we look at the isotopic results for these four individuals, nothing stands out about them, really, or marks them as different from the rest of the sampled population. You can see here on the strontium results that they fall within the local allolock range. And the same is true for oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. All the results mark them as local, with all of them falling within what could be considered normal population variation. This isn't necessarily surprising. This tomb is unique, clearly special, probably expressing an, an elite identity. If this family was part of the city's elite, then it would make sense that they were locals. If we return to a few of the individuals we've discussed, it's clear that we're now able to reconstruct their lives in some detail. The well lady is a genetic outlier who descended from populations originating well to the east and north of Alalak, though she seems to have grown up at Alalak. She was in her 40s when she died, and her skeleton showed heavy degenerative joint disease and well-heeled fractures to her ribs and skull, all indicative of a life with hard physical labor. She wasn't buried at all, really, not properly, but was instead thrown face down into a well, a possible victim of murder. Allah 110, one of the non-locals seen in the strontium data set, grew up somewhere outside the Amuk and the immediate region, but was descended from genetically similar populations to the inhabitants of Alalak. He was an older man when he died in his 60s or 70s, though he came to Alalak long before his death, probably sometime in his later childhood or early adolescence, based on the strontium value from his M3. After his death, he was buried in the Area 3 cemetery in a way that is archeologically indistinguishable from the rest of the burials there. The plastered tomb, on the other hand, represents perhaps the very de definition of the term distinct. This very rich and elaborate tomb stands out starkly from the rest of the burial corpus at the site, and indeed in the region, since no close parallels have yet been discovered for it, although there are certain aspects of it that can be related more easily to contemporary burial practices in the wider region. The tomb had four members of a family group, all of whom died in adulthood. They're all isotopically local and part of the same genetic group as the rest of the sampled population. So, Although we have all of this fabulous data and can tell really a lot about their lives, how much does this tell us about who they were, their identities, about the kinds of questions I touched on at the beginning of this talk? The answer seems to me to be not a lot, really. Reconstructing their life histories in this specific case hasn't necessarily proved particularly useful for understanding what the facets of their identities may have been. In this case, we have been able to distinguish locals from non-locals, 
But that information hasn't provided much of an understanding of their identities beyond that. And as is especially clear in the case of the well lady, what do these terms, local and non-local, really mean even? Do we call the well lady local since she seems to have grown up at Alalak? What about her distinct genetic signature? Does it make her non-local? Can we know what social or cultural group she belonged to or identified with? and how that impacted on her lived experience during her lifetime. With the data we currently have, it doesn't really seem so to me, but it's only through the intersection of all of these different analyses and types of data, DNA, isotopes, osteological and archeological analysis, that we're able to recognize her as a fascinating case who to our minds at least was different from many of her contemporaries. It's not just the well lady that confounded our expectations. Indeed, on the whole, aspects of identity don't align very well with the isotopic and DNA results. And there are no clear correlations except for secondary burials. The reasons for which are certainly suggestive of the expression of some kind of identity, though this can't yet be confirmed definitively. This is not to say that isotopes can't get at these questions. I'm sure everyone here knows of isotopic studies that have revealed these types of distinctions in other cases, but just that they don't in this particular case. Though dietary differences based on age and sex are apparent, other variables don't seem to map onto or correlate with distinct diets. Through the strontium and DNA results in particular, we're able to trace complex mobility patterns across multiple scales from regional and small scale migration within the Alalak Ebler region and the Amuk Valley. But apart from the ancestors of the well lady, there's little evidence for long distance migration. But it's also important to keep in mind that there's much that these results can obscure or which they're not well suited to revealing. Isotopically similar diets don't mean, of course, that there weren't differences in what people ate, just that those things had similar isotopic signatures. Diets among different portions of the population could have been very different but if the isotopic sources of those diets were similar, then those differences wouldn't be visible to us in these results. Similarly, long distance migration may have been a much more common occurrence, but if it was restricted to adulthood and was temporary with people returning to their homes either later in life or after death for burial, then it also would not be visible with these methods. This doesn't mean that identity was not expressed through funerary rituals at Alalak. And there are other indications in the burial corpus, the details of which I haven't gone into today for time reasons, but that I'm happy to talk more about afterwards if anyone would like, that different facets of identity were marked in these rituals. As a couple of very brief examples, different age and sex groups are associated with different grave goods, with infants and children, adult females and adult males, more commonly receiving specific ceramic vessel types. This suggests that these vessels may have had specific meanings for these different groups, perhaps holding specific types of oils worn in life or used in funerary rituals or containing specific beverages associated with different groups. We also see specific types of jewelry associated with different age and sex groups with adult females almost exclusively being given pins, especially toggle pins and infants and children being given a plainer form of pin, the scroll head pin. This suggests that different groups were dressed differently for death in preparation for funerary rituals, and perhaps also in life, if the personal adornments recovered in graves were personal possessions that an individual wore during their lifetime. However, many aspects of identity do not seem to have been expressed primarily through burial practices, at least not in ways that are visible either isotopically or genetically with the exception of the choice of secondary burial treatments as revealed by the strontium isotopes. Some aspects of identity thus remain elusive in the study of the burials at Telachana, though others are more clearly expressed. We should not be surprised that certain facets and identities were expressed through funerary practices while others were not. As I began this talk by reminding us all, identity is both fluid and multifaceted. And not every aspect of an individual's identity would have been considered appropriate or necessary to display during funerary rituals. What I'd like to emphasize in closing 
is the truly great potential of bioarchaeological analyses in contributing to studies of identity, but also the limitations of some of our methods. The evidence we have for the individuals buried at Talachana give us, in some cases, amazing insight into their lives, but this is only the first step. In order to go beyond the simple binary of local and non-local, to begin trying to understand who these people were, we need not only a combination of multiple lines of evidence, multiple analyses, but also to keep in mind the complex nature of identity and perhaps develop new ways, new theories, new methods to try and understand it in the past. So thank you everyone for your attention today. I'd like to thank again, all my partners in this work once more, and I'm happy to take any questions or discuss anything further. Thank you very much, Tara, for an excellent uh, presentation. We can have the questions uh, in the chat, if you prefer, or you're welcome to turn your camera on or uh, just your microphone on and ask questions. Are there any? Uh, if not, oh, there is, oh, there's a raised hand. Yes, great. Uh, please go ahead. That was absolutely one of the most fascinating lectures I've ever heard. That was wonderful. <laughs> well, Where you, you. Put, put everything together. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts. Um, one thing, um, the immediate thing is when you go get to go through the the burial goods mm -hmm. for identity markers. There was a lecture. I think it was about Armenia, actually, but I'm not from one of the comments that she said. I'm trying to remember. I, I heard it fairly recently, but you know, you take notes and it flies by. Sure. But anyway, um, she was dealing with sets of jewelry, you know, like earrings and bracelets mm -hmm. and pins and things like that. Um, on women's graves, and she noticed that there were